Welcome to another episode of the Neuroanatomy series that's being run by Nansig. Uh, my name is Robin Borchert. I'm a clinical neuroscience AFP. I'm an F1 at the moment. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing the brain's vasculature. So let's first have a look at what we're going to cover in this video. So the main focus of this video is the arterial supply to the brain. And I'd say that the target audience for this is um, medical students, particularly those medical students in their preclinical years of medical school. So we'll first look at the arterial supply from an anatomical perspective, following it from the heart all the way into the brain. And then we'll tie in some clinically relevant scenarios. So for example, individuals with stroke, aneurysms, things like that. And then at the end, I'll give you some uh, resources for further reading if you want to explore this further. So the brain has a very high demand for nutrients. And because of this, it receives a disproportionate amount of blood relative to the actual size of the brain. So in terms of cardiac output, it receives about 15% of the cardiac output, which is quite high. So we'll look at the arterial supply now, and we'll start with the heart, which I'll outline here. So first we have the blood coming out of the heart in the ascending aorta, and then the descending aorta. And one of the first branches, or the first branch of the aorta, is the brachiocephalic artery, which at this point splits into the right subclavian and into the right common carotid. So this is one of our first arteries that's leading into the brain. The left common carotid on the other side is actually a branch directly from the aorta. So it's the second branch of the aorta, which becomes the left common carotid. At around this point, um, on both sides, the common carotid splits into the internal and external carotid arteries. So I'm highlighting here the external carotid arteries, and these mainly supply the neck and the head, um, but not the intracranial structures, so we're not going to focus on them here. The intracranial structures are mainly supplied by the internal carotid arteries, which I'm highlighting now. Other structures here, which are of relevance, are the vertebral arteries. So we have the right vertebral artery here coming off of the right subclavian, and we have the left vertebral artery here coming off of the left subclavian. And they supply uh, blood into the brain as well, and we'll look into a bit more detail into these arteries on the next slide. In terms of clinical relevance, so the carotids are quite important because especially around this area where I highlighted before, where it can split into the external and internal carotids, you can get furring of the artery. And for example, this can involve a buildup of a plaque, and the plaque can stenose the artery to the point where it's not able to supply the brain with as much blood as it used to be able to. Another issue that can arise from this is that bits of the plaque can break off and embolize into the brain, causing a stroke. Now in these situations where the stenosis is very severe, or for example, if someone's had a transient ischemic attack where they've had symptoms of a stroke, um, but they haven't been permanent, these individuals can be referred to the vascular surgeons and they can be reviewed for an operation uh, such as a carotid endarterectomy. And what this involves is you can clamp the arteries above and below the plaque and you can cut it open and remove the plaque and then sew it up again, as they did here. And this reduces the risk of having, for example, strokes in the future. So the next slide, we're gonna have a look at the brain's vasculature as if we're under the brain looking upwards. So we're looking at the brain from the bottom here. And just to give you some orientation based on a lot of the arteries we were discussing in the last slide. So right here, we got the internal carotids that are coming up into the brain. And we also have the vertebral arteries, which are coming up here, and they derive from the subclavian arteries bilaterally. And so the vertebral arteries, as you can see, they converge up here and they form the basilar artery. And together, the vertebral arteries and the basilar artery, they're quite important for supplying the upper part of the spinal cord, uh, the, the brain stem, which is this kind of area that lies underneath these arteries, as well as these big hemispheres on either side, which comprise the cerebellum. But moving upwards, uh, what's very important, especially in medical school and exams, just knowing your anatomy in terms of clinical relevance, 
um, is identifying this kind of make-believe circle which is formed by the arteries surrounding this area. And this is called the Circle of Willis. And the fact that it's a circle uh, isn't by accident. Um, there are some evolutionary benefits to it. So for example, if there's any compromise to the arterial architecture around here, there's collateral supply due to its, um, its structure which can, can help uh, supply blood to that region that's in need. So the main arteries that you want to know in this area are the, uh, the first of all, there's the anterior cerebral arteries, and these are joined by an anterior communication, which is just at the top in the middle here. You have the middle cerebral arteries, which are these big ones that come off in the middle. Um, these are very clinically relevant because they're a common site of ischemic strokes. And this kind of makes sense because if you have a, a clot or an embolus that derives from the heart or the carotids and they shoot up and through these internal carotids that I drew before with these arrows, they enter through the internal carotids and they just need to make a short journey into these middle cerebral arteries where they can lodge and cause an ischemic stroke. And then at the back you have the posterior cerebral arteries. And together all of these arteries um, make or comprise the components of the, the circle of Willis. So we talked a bit about stroke, but there's another clinically relevant topic to this. So the circle of Willis is a common site of aneurysms, and these are specifically berry aneurysms. So on the bottom left here, you can see there's aneurysms are these outpouchings of the arteries. And these can be asymptomatic for a long time, but um, they, they can cause some problems. So if they get big enough, they can compress local structures causing symptoms. But one of the, the more feared complications is that they can rupture. And when they rupture, they bleed into that area and they can cause things like subarachnoid hemorrhages. So on the bottom right, we have a CT. It's not the best CT and you might be able to find better examples online. But if you can see in the middle, there's this hyperdense area here with kind of like finger-like projections. And this is quite a um, classic image of a subarachnoid hemorrhage on a CT scan. Okay, so now we'll have a look at the regional supply of each of those vessels we discussed. And at the bottom, again, we have this uh, reference image looking at the brain from the bottom to understand where the vessels actually are. And at the top, we have two new images. So on the left, we have a lateral view of the brain, so we're looking at the brain from the side, whereas on the right, we have a medial view of the brain. So we're still looking at the brain from the side, but it's as if we cut the brain in half. Right, so let's start with the anterior cerebral artery, and I'm just going to highlight that at the bottom here for reference, and we, we had a look at this before but it supplies the yellow region at the top. So this is uh, supplying much of the frontal lobe of the brain, but also a very significant medial aspect of the brain too, and we'll discuss the relevance of this in a second. Um, we'll look at the middle cerebral artery next. So that's coming off the middle here at the bottom, and this corresponds, in, corresponds to the red region at the top. And this is a very large region, especially when you're looking at the brain from a lateral aspect. Um, and this supplies a lot of different functions as well. So, for example, on the language dominant side of the brain, it supplies Broca's area and Wernicke's area. These are very important for generating speech, but also understanding speech. This area also is important for sensation and motor function as well. It supplies most of the motor function in the body. However, there is something that needs to be clarified about this because it can get a bit complicated. And to do this, I'll introduce another image. And this image is called a homunculus. So this is a coronal view of the brain sliced in half um, at the motor aspect of the brain. And these are the different parts of the brain that supply different parts of the body in terms of motor function. So if we look at the lateral aspect, so uh, I'm just drawing that aspect now. So this part of the motor cortex is, corresponds mainly to this red region above, which is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. So these areas include, for example, the face, the hands, the upper limbs, the trunk, and this aspect of motor function in the body is uh, controlled by the area of the brain that's supplied by the middle cerebral artery. But if we start to look at the more medial aspect of the motor cortex, this, is, uh, this corresponds to the yellow region, and that's this medial aspect here. And this is mainly supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. So the motor cortex varies in which artery is supplying um, the, the corresponding region, and that's important to, to note. And then moving on to the posterior cerebral artery, which I'll also highlight at the bottom here. This corresponds to the blue region, so this is a very posterior aspect of the brain. 
it supplies the inferior aspect of the temporal lobe, but also most of the occipital lobe as well, which is obviously very important for things like vision. Okay, so now let's have a deeper dive into stroke. And we'll focus on uh, the upper image, which again is our reference image, and we'll look at the middle cerebral artery. So this is the one I'm highlighting now, and this is on the left-hand side of the patient. Um, and again, this is a common site for a ischemic stroke in patients. So let's focus on the bottom now. So there are two CT images. First, have a look at the left-hand side, and I'll give you a few moments just to have a look and see if you identify any abnormalities in that scan. So what you might see is that there's a hyperdense middle cerebral artery on the left side, which corresponds to a clot within that vessel. So this represents a patient who's undergoing an ischemic stroke within the left middle cerebral artery. And if we move on to the right side, you can see which um, this area, which corresponds to where the red area is pointing, and it's this darkened area of the brain. And this likely represents a part of the brain which is being supplied by the middle cerebral artery, but is being starved of oxygen because there's an ischemic clot within the middle cerebral artery. And what's interesting is that there, there are a few different ways of approaching this in terms of treating such patients. So a long-standing approach to teaching, uh, treating this is thrombolysis, but a more emerging technique is something called mechanical thrombectomy, which is done by someone, for example, an interventional neuroradiologist. And what this involves is taking a catheter, a wire, inserting it through the radial or femoral arteries, and then guiding it up the vasculature all the way up into the brain so that they can access this area where the clot is, and they can deploy devices which essentially grab the clot, and then they can suck it out and remove it. And the uh, intention is to remove the clot, restore blood supply to that area of the brain, and to relieve the patients of their symptoms. So just to wrap things up now, uh, this short presentation has been about the arterial supply to the brain. So we focused on uh, initially the anatomy, so understanding the anterior, middle, and cerebral arteries and how those arteries are supplied by the heart and the vasculature which leads from the heart into the brain. We had a look at the circle willis um, and the relevance of that, as well as the regional supply of each of those three vessels and in particular the relevance to the motor cortex and how different parts of the motor cortex are supplied by different um, actual arteries. So one part is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery, so that's the lower limbs, and the rest of the body, so the trunk, the upper limbs, the face, um, those are mainly supplied by the middle cerebral artery. Then we had a look at the clinical relevance um, of the arterial supply to the brain in terms of stroke. So for example, patients having a middle cerebral artery ischemic stroke, and then we had also had a look at aneurysms as well. So I'd like to thank you for watching this video. We have a few other neuroanatomy videos um, via the NANSIG website and the YouTube channel at the moment, and there will be further ones coming along in the near future. Here's some further reading you might be interested to look into. Um, I didn't cover everything in depth. This was really just a brief overview, so if you want to look at anything in more detail, these are good places to start. And here are just some references and acknowledgments. Thank you again. Bye-bye.